one of the things that I've worked a lot with is going and picking up cats individually. And that's for people who are either mentally, physically, or economically unable to transport their animals to the toy. And that's very satisfying. I had a uh, lady call me. She wanted to get her cat fixed. It was her only family. And she really was desperate to get this cat fixed. The apartments where she was, they, the cat had to be fixed. It was going in heat. It was annoying people. And I said, can you drive? Can you meet me? Oh, honey, I can't drive. So I went up at 4 o'clock in the morning and picked up her cat. And she met me at the door. Well, sort of met me at the door. She was totally paralyzed except for her hands. She is almost blind. And that is a really good feeling when you can help those people. And they are out there, but they don't know we're here. How, do you, how are you advertising? Well, we've got, we go through, a lot of it is word of mouth once it gets going. But we also have the, some of the, uh, the social services, um, the food banks, they all have our name. Um, a lot of the social workers are so putting So do you set attention. up the appointments like with All About Animals? I set up the appointments with All About Animals. So the, the people that are in financial and contact yes. your organization, right. and you then set up the fay or the neuter with? Right. Okay. Right. We get them there because that's the important part. And sometimes that means that we they can't drive to us, we have to drive to them. So that's, you know, our, our goal is as many as possible. Last year we did just over 600. And uh, this year I think we're already about 135. How many are you? How many are I? Yeah, how many? Uh, how many are transporting right now? Sure. That would be me. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me transporting. Yeah. But I'm retired now. I did that last year when I wasn't retired. So uh, I'm hoping for better numbers this year. You know, this year I can go every week, and that's what we've been doing. And we're working with a couple shelters who are now getting their animals fixed before they go out. Do you have a radius of where you, what you would no. compass? I, I have gone all the way down south of Monroe, to Monroe, all the way up past Whitmore Lake, and all over. If, if, if it, that's what it takes to get sure. an animal fixed. Because a lot of people, they just don't have the service. They just can't get out. They don't drive. And, do you have uh, requirements or restrictions? I mean, do they have to show you uh, tax receipts or anything? Including for the low income, income yeah. we ask for, for proof of low income, sure. or if they're getting bridge a bridge card, uh, food stamps, um, for their unemployment. But as far as, uh, like the lady who called who was, who was black, she, she paid full price. She just couldn't get anybody to take her animal. You know? And, and she's not the only one out there. There's a lot of them out there. And a lot of those is just, you know, you get her and she tells somebody else, the, the gal done, you know, that lost her license ages ago because she's too old to drive now. And they won't let her drive and bring her cat. So those are the good ones. Yes. Um, as transporter, are you aware of other um, organizations that offer not or low income services? Uh, either, besides I, just all animals? Well, we've used all about animals because they're the closest. Mm -hmm. We've also used Humane Ohio. Okay. Um, that's worked out best for me personally. Yes. You have about two or three minutes. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> and then there is a hotline, Spay, Michigan. If yeah, there's a hotline, Spay, Michigan, Michigan okay. that can direct people to something that's closer in their area. Yeah, yes. I just I was just going to mention that Adopt a Pet in Fenton also. Yes, yes they also we've also <laughs> sent people to them. Yeah, and it's close. And I, I have business cards here. Well, fortunately, we were lucky enough to get a grant recently, which allows us to do dogs at no cost to the owner. Um, they do have to cover the cost of any heartworm testing or rabies vaccinations that they have done, but the spay neuter is free. So. And you're still <laughs> opening the clinic. What's your spay schedule? Um, I'm usually there. We usually do surgery Monday through Thursday minimally. Sometimes Monday through Friday. Okay. Yeah, because we refer people up there. It was and just do, out of my reach, you know, in Flint area. Right. We do the low cost work for rescue groups, so they can mm -hmm. send animals, you know, in groups and do them in one day and then we're also open to the public for low cost or free depending on their situation and that's that's really important mm -hmm. too. you know we we have a snap fund it works where um our donations that come in can either subsidize a spay neuter or pay for it mm -hmm. and we ask the people to pay but we recognize that some of them can and it's really important i don't want to hear about the pit bull who has 
three litters and if I know that I could have stopped that. Mm -hmm. I don't want to hear about the cat that's now in its third or fourth litter. Let's just stop it. And as a rescue group, part of our policy is if you bring us a litter of kittens, mama's got to be spayed. No question. That's it. We can't, we can't continue to take cat people from, cats from people that are not going to take care of them. Well, All right, great. Thank you. Um, so next up we have Dr. Adams, and he's the veterinarian um, at CSNF. It's one of five high volume spinner clinics in the state now, um, and they're pretty much the model, so you know, of excellence for spinner clinics. So, um, Dr. Adams, can tell you all about that. Thank you. Um, as Amber said, uh, we are what is termed a high quality, high volume spay neuter clinic. And the term high quality is in there very importantly because we stress the fact that the surgeries that are done at high volume clinics need to be done at the same standards as the surgeries done at private clinics. It's very important. <coughs> Being a nonprofit, it allows us to concentrate our resources in that area. Um, we do between 11 and 12,000 procedures a year that interprets out to between 50 and 80 surgeries a day depending on the, the workload that's done with two veterinarians. So each veterinarian is doing between 25 and 40 uh, surgeries a day. Uh, we have <coughs> procedures and processes that allow us to do that very, very efficiently and I'll kind of work you through sort of what a day in the life of uh, a CSNF animal is. The, the um, animals arrive at 7.30 in the morning. Um, they are checked in at the front desk, get all the paperwork and everything around. Then they are, the people go out to their car, bring in their animals. Their animals are divided between the cat room and the dog room. And, and they go there where they, where then they are also checked in, examined by the veterinarian, um, administered any pre-medication that they need to have. Um, during that time, we're frantically drawing up all their drugs to get them ready so that we can get the first animal down. We try to get the first animal in surgery by uh, 9 or 9.30 in the morning. We process our largest dogs first, work our largest females first, work our way down to our smallest females, and we do our largest males, work our way down to the smallest males. And the reason, the rationale for that is any complications you're going to have are going to be in large female dogs primarily. As you get to smaller female dogs, the complication rate decreases. Male dogs, the complication really decreases. But if we can get our biggest dogs first, it's while everybody's fresh. You know, everybody's, you know, nobody's worn out and tired. So you get your great Danes done when everybody's still got their strength. And by the time you get to the end of the day, you're neutering cats. And that's a perfect way to end your day. Um, so <clears throat> basically we do the surgeries. We try to get our, all, all of the dogs done by one o'clock. And at our clinic, we discharge the dogs the same day that we bring them in. Um, we, we do that mainly because of the logistics. Um, in the morning when we discharge, having a kennel full of dogs, having to get them out, get the kennels cleaned and get the new dogs in, it just doesn't work to do it any other way. So they go home. We don't have problems with that. that we, the complication rates or the problems that we run into after they get home are minimal. Um, so, we, so we get away with that just fine. The cats we keep overnight. We, and we do the cats in the afternoon. So they're, they could just take up the rest of the afternoon. They're there through the night and overnight. And the reason for that is, is that if you, if you have a, if you bring your dog home, the dog lays by your feet. If it's having trouble, it's laying there by your feet. If you bring a cat home, the cat, if the cat's having a problem, it's probably gonna go hide somewhere and you're not gonna know it's having a problem. So we get to check all of our cats the next day in the morning, make sure everything's doing okay, everything's going fine before they go home. So there's, there's kind of a rationale of how we do everything. Um, and then basically with the dogs, the owners show back up at four o'clock in the afternoon. Um, they're in mass in our lobby. They're given their discharge instructions and then they're given their dogs one at a time, you know, explaining any possible problems or complications to them as we give the, hand them out. 
and then in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning the owners show up and the cats the, the cats are discharged at that time um, our anesthesia that we use is is state-of-the-art for anesthesia our monitoring is state-of-the-art um, we use gas anesthesia we use pain meds on everybody. The cats are given a narcotic and they're given an, uh, an anti-inflammatory and the dogs are given morphine and they're given an anti-inflammatory to go home. Um, and, and that's very important that that, that step not get skipped. Um, pain medication is standard of care in veterinary medicine now for all the animals and is not an option not to do it. It's very important to the whole protocol and, and what we call high quality um, that, that we maintain that standard. Um, we also at CSNF we train, we have several externs come from MSU senior veterinary staff or veterinary school. Um, they come in and, and uh, work for a three week rotation through us. Um, it's amazing sometimes how we get these fourth year students in and we say, okay, what have you done? And they say, well, I helped neuter a dog. That's their training for, for the vet school. So this gives them an the opportunity to come in and by the time they get through our program, they're very proficient in, in doing at least the spays and neuters and you can see their surgical skills just improve drastically over that time. So it's a good opportunity for them, good opportunity for us to to have veterinarians graduate for school who understand what spay neuter clinics are. And I think very important to listening to Dr. Anderson, we are finally getting veterinarians who are seeing the problem and are passionate about doing something about it. And you listen to her talk, you can tell she's very passionate about what she does. I am very passionate about what I do. I was in practice for 28 years prior to taking this on and I took it on for what it was. I wanted to see how this worked, how it would work, and I wanted to make sure that it got done properly. And this is where the, once again, the high quality part comes in. If you, there are ways to do this with a lot less quality, a lot less concern for the animal, a lot less concern for sterility and protocols and this kind of thing. And what we do is we, we when we, started out as, as one of the first Humane Alliance clinics that were established. I remember that one of the things that I took to heart when we were down there is they said, we want you to be stewards of the mission. Where our mission is to establish high quality clinics in strategic locations around the country to deal with this problem and we want you to be stewards of the mission. And what that meant to me is, is that I need to do everything I can to make sure that other clinics in the area perform things as good as we do. So I work with All About Animals, I work with West Michigan Spay Neuter Clinic, I work with us and any other clinics that, that need help getting protocols established to do the job in, a, in an efficient but a high quality manner. So we work with those clinics, help them get their procedures and protocols in line, I, and, and I feel very strongly about that. So if anybody here is thinking about a clinic, um, we're available 100% to help you get things established and going the way that you need to have them go. So can you explain uh, what Humane Alliance is? So I'm not sure oh, that everybody... Humane Alliance is an organization that started several years ago. They were just basically started as a spay neuter clinic down in North Carolina, in Asheville. And they had a, a dream of setting this clinic up and they managed to put together a remarkable group of people who all kind of had the same idea of where they were heading. And they, they set up this remarkably efficient, very effective spay-neuter clinic down there. Um, in recognizing this, they received a grant to start a mentoring program where they, they help clinics get established help them set themselves up, help them get, get the equipment, help them with grants, um, understanding how this is all put together. And they, I, where are they at, 70? I think 90. 90? 90, 90, yeah. They've established 90 clinics across the country to date, and they're doing them, they're doing them every day, adding new 
clinics to that schedule. Idea here is, is spay neuter clinics need to become mainstream in our culture. It's a, it's, you can't define a problem, define a solution, and then not give people the resources to get it done. And in veterinary medicine, having been in this for 30 years now, we, as veterinarians, we have been goaded in the last 15, 20 years saying, you're not charging enough for what you do. You need to charge for what you do. Well, what happens in that scenario is we end up charging for what we do, but we end up charging more for the things we do every day. And so the cost, if you just watch the cost for spay neuter services just go up and up and up and up and up. And pretty soon when you're faced with a situation where it's going to cost you $300 to get your dog you adopted from somewhere neutered, it can't be done. So what, in the, this scenario, what we've done is we just said, look, veterinary community, you know, you've been challenged with the problem, you have not dealt with it. And now normal citizens are saying enough's enough. And CSNP was formed by a group of concerned citizens in Grand Rapids who said, people can't afford space and noters, and it's got to be done. We are going to have to do something about it. So they started this clinic, and I explained this to the veterinarians in our area repeatedly, uh, <laughs> over and over. Um, this is not Dr. Adams setting up a clinic and doing a bunch of cheap space and neuters. This was a group of people who said, you guys are out to lunch. We're going to go ahead and take this on ourselves to get this done because you guys aren't dealing with it. You don't get it. And so they started this, and it's like, they're not going away. You know, if you're not going to convince me as a veterinarian that I shouldn't be doing this, that I'm hurting the profession and all this, other, these people aren't going to go away. I can quit and somebody be in my place in, you know, in 10 minutes. So get off that bandwagon and get on the bandwagon and say, okay, veterinary medicine is no longer going to be mainstream spaying and neuter animals. That's going to now go shift over to the spay and neuter clinics that are going to handle this. And we've got to go on with our profession and figure out how we're going to take from there, because this is a matter of fact. And what we are as a high volume clinic, and all about animals is the same way, we're a central facility to handle the spay and neuter needs of a large area, which is where when Valerie talks about transporting, the transports are very crucial to what we do. We can't set and say, okay, we're going to do 80 animals a day and assume that the people in Grand Rapids are gonna call us 80 people a day to schedule this. We have to get out to those other areas. We, we do a high enough volume that we're not just a Grand Rapids thing, we're not just a Kent County thing, we're a multi-county area, and that's where transport really comes in and, and fills in the void, is they're the ones that are out there in those underserved areas where there isn't a sea snip or an all about animals or a pause or, but they're, they're, they're in those outside areas, they're bringing them into us. So transports are extremely crucial to, to what we do and how we do it, because we can't get out there. And um, transports, you know, you could do it all about animals, has their own van. CSNF is going to be doing that too, because there are some situations like shelters, you know, smaller shelters that can't afford their own veterinarian. They still have the same problem. They're adopting out intact animals on a promise that they'll get done, and we can we know for a fact they don't get done. We've got vouchers that deep of people who actually paid for the service. They paid sixty dollars to get a neuter and never showed up. So it it the voucher system doesn't work at all. The only way to do it is for us to do whatever we can to encourage the shelters to get their animals paid and neutered prior to adoption. Um, bigger counties. Um, Kent County has their own veterinarian at the shelter who does all of those. Um, Humane Society of West Michigan has their own veterinarian who handles making sure that all gets done. But smaller counties in the area, they can't afford that. And if they don't have a veterinarian who will get on board and go and do it, you know, voluntarily for a while um, to get this thing started, that's where transport also helps. 
that if you can get a situation where you can go to those shelters, get those animals that were adopted out on Monday, get them spayed and neutered, have the people come pick them up after they're done, problem solved and they're not out there. But like I said, we know for a fact in our area that the voucher system is a total failure. So um, we, so that's another thing we do. And this, like I said, we're not just sitting there doing space in order. We're very proactive. We're proactive with the veterinary community, trying to convince them that you know they need to get on board with this um, and refer their people who can't afford it. You know, every vet clinic knows that there are people that come to them that can't afford these services. Send them to us. You know, we're not stealing your client. We're doing one procedure. We're sh and then we're handing them back to you. If we see if a dog comes in and it's got an ear infection, we write ear infection to your veterinarian. We don't take on that case for the six months or whatever it takes to get it under control. That's the veterinarian's business. We hand it right to them. All we do is the spays and odors. And that's very important for everybody to know and, and for the veterinary community to know is that we, all we're doing is spaying and neutering pushing them back out to you guys, and you guys take care of them the rest of their lives. We're getting one thing done and making sure it gets done. And actually, if we talk to the veterinary community, we explain to them, if you let us do our $65 pay instead of the $300 pay, they have $235 to come to you and get their vaccines and their heartworm and that kind of so stuff. So you guys don't do any vaccines? We do rabies. Mm -hmm. um, we, our philosophy has been, we do spays and neuters. Mm -hmm. Well, reality of the fact is we do spays and neuters, but we're also a business. And any business, in any business, particularly when you're a nonprofit and you're trying to take all of your donations and that kind of stuff and actually turn it over into more spays and neuters. So we use all of our donation money for subsidy of people who can't afford it people can't afford all of it. You know, all of our people are screened for what they can afford. If anybody who calls us, regardless of their ability to pay, they will get spayed or neutered. You know, we just have to work out the, the terms of that, whether they can afford it. If they can't afford it all, we have funds and work hard to develop funds to keep that program alive. Given the volume of need, is there any stats that show that there actually is business being taken away from the veterinarians? If you ask the veterinarians, we're killing us. <laughs> you know, we are, we are, we will run them out of business by doing this. Um, the statistics, the true statistics are no. Um, we have veterinary clinics who say they don't do spays and neuters, and then, you know, how are our, our, we've actually have them say our staff is losing their surgical skills because we're doing all the spays and neuters. And it's like, um, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. So. <laughs> there, there are studies that show that spay neuters actually increase because the spay neuter clinics are doing the education piece of it. Yeah, so that, that sometimes is very, can benefit. That is very true. You know, what I, what I tell the veterinarian when I talk to them, I said, you know, you don't, first of all, you're dealing with the tip of the iceberg with the people who are out there. You assume that you're covering everybody and you're not even covering the top 25%. There is a whole bunch of people down here that, that don't use veterinarians, don't even know where one is, don't even know that their animal has a problem even though it doesn't have any hair anymore and it's got big swords on it. They're like, what are you talking about? Maybe allergies, you know, it's the front, you know, the front of my dog. So people just aren't aware. And so when we make them aware, we we actually turn them on to the fact that maybe they should go to the veterinarian. You know, the, the problem is is finding veterinary finding veterinary care that's affordable for those people. And we've actually are working on a program with our local veterinary association that will take the Grand Rapids and surrounding county areas, and we'll divide it into quarters, have a red, blue, yellow, green area, and then the people, when they get discharged, will get a sheet, depending on what area they are, of the veterinarians in their area that are willing to see their animals. It's a voluntary program, so the veterinarians can sign up to be on this list, and they will get a, a list saying, you know, here are the veterinarians in your area who would be happy to see your animals. Some of them are giving them a you know, sort of like the lawyer, your free initial examination, that kind of thing. 
So we're trying to work with them to show them that we're actually a positive influence in the veterinary community and not a negative one and not hurting anything. We're actually helping them do it. And they're slowly catching on. You just keep giving them the same answer over and over again and eventually it clicks. Similarly, um, is anybody in here from Ingham County? No? There's an interesting program that goes on through Ingham County Animal Control and Shelter, and that is a vaccine clinic that runs multiple times a year in Ingham County, and it targets the areas where there's poverty, where people are underserved, and it's based on the demographics of gangs and guns and drugs. And um, the veterinarians volunteer. There's a volunteer list. I've gone and volunteered. Multiple veterinarians in Ingham County have gone and volunteered. We're sitting there, we're giving vaccines. And the veterinarians, I'm not, I practice very little in private practice. I don't have enough time, but the veterinarians there that are practicing in private practice, we're saying, your dog looks like it might have a skin issue. And they're going, yeah, really, what do I do? And they're going, here's my card. Mm -hmm. you know, they're getting capturing clients that way too. So it's really a matter of educating our colleagues. And we as veterinarians are very conservative and very frightened. Now I sat in the first lecture and I was a little distressed because I heard snotty comments about the veterinarians behind me and all the money we're making. We're not making a lot of money. We're small businesses. We're trying to support employees. You know, the small business person is hurting in Michigan. The veterinarian is no different. We're not the enemy. On the other hand, veterinarians are incredibly independent souls. I grew up on a farm. The only person more independent than a veterinarian is a farm. <laughs> and we work in isolation. And we're a bit ignorant. We're very smart about our medicine. But we're a bit ignorant about community awareness. And so the job is not to be the veterinarian as the, as the enemy, but to work to educate and not be snotty while you're doing it. Because we don't like snotty. <laughs> okay? We well, don't like being told we're not rescue friendly. And I think another thing to realize, too, is that you know you can't begrudge a business for having to cover its overhead and cover mm -hmm. its employees. But the veterinarians are just like anything else. You mm -hmm. could choose to shop at the most expensive clothing store. You can choose to go to Kohl's. Depends on which ones you, how much you want to pay for what you're doing and what you're actually getting out of it. And, and so some places need to charge $350 for spay. That's just the way they've got to do to cover their overhead. And you can't begrudge anybody that. You just have to realize that there is a huge batch of people who can't afford $300 for a spay. And you've got to give those people some way to get it done because the bottom line is the spay and neuter has to be done. The rest of it's optional. Well, I you know. think for me, it was a huge turning point is when I decided that for myself as a veterinarian, if the going rate for a spay would be difficult for me to afford, yeah, something's wrong with that picture. Well, that's what, when we were talking to our local association, one of the veterinarians said, you know, I wouldn't pay what you're charging for Right, that. exactly. I, I, mean, I wouldn't do it. Yeah. I wouldn't do it. So, so thank you, Dr. Yeah. Um, and just so you guys, and so everybody knows that um, there's lots of grants out there to do this stuff. There's DJT, State of Michigan um, is giving grants, uh, PetSmart, Petco, um, you know, so if you need subsidy funding, it's out there. And then if anybody is interested in transport, our vans, um, we're warned, but we're willing to go as far as Bay City um, if we can, you know, work with the rescue group or somebody out there. So thanks so much for coming. I appreciate Thank you. it. Yeah. You mentioned about transferring to, to local clinics. We're going to have a pause clinic opening up oh, in Taylor, yeah. Michigan. This is Chris Jordan. She's our executive director, and she's going to be running a really great clinic down there. And so my my hopping may be a lot shorter, but you know, I'll still June, 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 when, um, sometime this summer, summer, July. July. <laughs> uh oh, we're yeah. we're we're in the middle of construction, so it's kind of hard to say right now. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> Yes, sorry. Thank you. I forgot to do that.